are about to listen to the Dr. Dahlia Show. Sassy, stimulating medical talk radio. Any medical advice Dr. Dahlia Wax gives on her show should not be substituted for an actual visit to your medical provider. And now, here's Dr. Dahlia. All right, we are back at Dr. Dahlia Show, one 877 Dahlia, one 877 dahli So to nap or not to nap, that is the question. We have over the years heard naps are good and we've heard naps are bad. And if you're as confused as I am, that that's the norm, okay? In fact, I think I just need a nap from all this back and forth with it. But we have a little bit more data to share. Apparently, Health Digest has a nice piece on when you nap every day, here's what happens to your brain. And they look at a 2016 study published in the Journal of American Geriatric Society, and they found a link between a 30 to 90 minute nap after lunch helping one's cognitive function. The research involved analyzing self-reported data about napping from 2,900 people in China who were over 65 years old. The participants were grouped into non-nappers, short nappers. What's a short napper? Less than 30 minutes. Moderate nappers, 30 to 90 minutes. Extended nappers, more than 90 minutes. And then they looked at attention, episodic memory, visual spatial abilities were assessed. Moderate nappers, so those of us between 30 to 90 minutes with our nap, perform better overall, while non-nappers showed poor cognitive capabilities than short nappers. Now, this was one study, I remember talking about this back in 2016. It's one study of many, as we have had studies that are going back and forth between the benefits and drawbacks of napping. Um, We're still divided. There was a study in 2022 published in Alzheimer's and Dementia, and it linked daytime naps or siestas with a greater risk of Alzheimer's. Yet a 2021 study published in BMC Geriatrics on daytime naps and cognitive decline found if you did take a cat nap, like an under 30 minute nap, it reduced the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. So which is it? Now we know that Biden probably took naps. I don't blame him for doing that. Now he can take as many naps as he wants to. Well, he is still commander in chief, so that's a whole nother issue. But I've actually supported naps. And I'll tell you why. But we have one other study to uh, to uh, also look at. A 2023 study in sleep health looked at the data of 35,000 people aged 40 to 69 from a UK biobank study. And they found a link between frequent daytime napping and as much as a 15.8 cubic centimeter increase in total brain volume. Now. Lowering brain volume affects your aging. An increase in brain volume is a good sign. Didn't examine cognitive performance, but we definitely don't want your brain atrophying, which is, again, something I've wanted in terms of testing Biden for his mental acuity, looking at his brain volume on MRI. So the reason why I support you taking a nap if you want to take a nap is because your body's talking to you. If your body needs to rest, if your body needs to uh, put things to memory, if your body needs to regenerate or to heal some things, it's, it tells you to sleep. And I have tried to just plow through and not sleep, and my productivity stinks. And if I just give in and say, I'm going to take a small nap, and then I'm going to hopefully recover, and then I do better. So... If you feel like you need a nap, take a nap. Where this napping study or these studies insinuate that napping is bad is the why you need to nap. It's the why behind the napping. And I agree with that. If you are exhausted every day and you need to take naps every day, it's my job as a doctor to figure out why. Is it that you're only sleeping four hours at night? Is it that you're not getting a good seven to nine hours of sleep? Is it because you're drinking alcohol before you sleep, so it's not really good quality sleep? Is it because you have sleep apnea, where you cut off your air supply in your sleep, or you have central sleep apnea, where you stop breathing in your sleep, and you're losing oxygenation, so your body keeps waking yourself up? Is it because you have other medical conditions that are making you tired, like low thyroid? 
Is it medications you're taking that's making you tired? So when they say those individuals who need to take naps are at higher risk of cognitive decline or early death, it's not the nap that's killing you. It's the, or shortening your lifespan, it's the factors contributing to your needing to take that nap. And so that is why when we ask you as physicians, do you nap? What and how much and why do you need to nap? We need to also go to the backstory. Because if you do have sleep apnea, you are at higher risk for cardiac complications, high blood pressure complications, hence then cognitive issues, and then possibly early death. I've told you time and time again, if at all you're worried about your memory, get yourself a sleep study. Look at what oxygenation you're getting in your sleep. Because if you're not getting good oxygen to the brain, that is, of course, going to, that's hours upon hours each day, each week, each month, each year that you are depriving your brain of oxygen that you could be improving. And I'm telling you, you, you get a good sleep, a sleep apnea mask and you, you get treated for your sleep apnea, you'll show improvements in memory. You'll even show improvements in your metabolism. I had a patient who wasn't losing weight. I was like, look, let's treat your sleep apnea. Will you finally at least agree to it? I promise you, you'll lose some weight. His metabolism went up. You need oxygenation. You also need to feel rested. If you're not rested and, and instead of working out, you decide, oh, I'm just going to sleep in. Yeah, you get some better rest. You'll be able to exercise more. So once again, if you think you need to get some sleep, maybe you got COVID, maybe you have mono, maybe you're tired. But if you need sleep because you have anemia, well, you need to get that anemia figured out. If you have low thyroid, you need to get that figured out. If you have sleep apnea, you need to get that figured out. If you're depressed, if you're drinking alcohol, if you're taking Benadryl for your allergies and it's making you tired, if you're using marijuana and it's accumulating. So duration of naps are interesting. You know, taking a two, three hour nap in the middle of the day doesn't seem to have as good a data as taking a cat nap or a moderate nap. Most of my naps are between an hour to an hour and a half. Sometimes they're shorter, 10, 15 minutes, up and ready to go. And I've always been a napper. But make sure you talk to your medical provider about why you're napping. one 877 Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for healthcare can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge, but it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan, double MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 855-SHARE-40. That's 855-SHARE-40. 855-SHARE-40. Hey guys, it's Dr. Dahlia. Fantasy football season is coming, but sadly, too many of you are taking the bench while the country takes part in one of the most exciting and lucrative industries out there. Don't know how to play? Well, huddle up and listen. Paul Kalikas and I have written a fantasy football pocket guide for beginners. This book walks you through the basics and shows you how simple and lucrative joining or creating a fantasy football team can be. Read our Fantasy Football Pocket Guide for Beginners found on Amazon or follow the links on X and Facebook. That's Fantasy Football Pocket Guides for Beginners. Don't be left out. In a study, it was found that 33% of 44 herbal supplements had no trace of the advertised herb. Don't let that happen to you. Hi, this is Dr. Mitch. If you want to ensure quality, please go to TotalWellness.com. Supplements made for physicians only now available to you too. TotalWellness.com, helping you to look good, feel good, and enjoy Total Wellness.
All right. We are back on the Dr. Dolly Show. one 877 dolly one 877 Big thanks to Talk Media Network for making the show happen. Big thanks to Daniel, our producer. And big thanks to you all for tuning in. We really do appreciate it. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter or X at Dr. Dahlia, Facebook, The Dr. Dahlia Show, and on YouTube, click like and subscribe. So we speak a lot about history. I had earlier in the week talked about the presidents and their medical issues, and I really didn't want to rush through it because I know, um, you know, there, there's a lot of cool stuff, and I'm just fascinated by history, and I love medical history, and I collect medical antiques. You've seen me on Pawn Stars. So it's just kind of one of my hobbies. And so when you look at the health issues of the presidents, it's it's fascinating what some of them might have struggled with. Nowadays, especially with Biden, you hear about every single thing. Well, you might not. I don't know how transparent his administration has been, but, you know, we could pick up on things. We have doctors providing commentary on TV, you know, but back in the olden days, it was just by rumor and, and guessing. So George Washington, who lived a pretty long life, um, had uh, a lot of medical issues. We spoke about how he had suffered from diphtheria, tuberculosis, malaria, smallpox, dysentery, tonsillitis, epiglottitis. He was possibly had some sterile issues. And he also seemed to have issues with the back of his throat. I still cannot confirm if he had syphilis. I know there has been um, many people suggesting that he might have been afflicted with syphilis at one time, and Abraham Lincoln supposedly had it. I can't confirm that. But it was fascinating that George Washington did lose most of his teeth. He only had one original tooth left by the time he was president. So he had false teeth made of hippopotamus, walrus, elephant, ivory, or he might have had transplanted teeth, but um, it wasn't wood. I know everybody says, yeah, he had wood teeth. No, wood would splinter. Wood doesn't do well when it gets wet. So they, 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 from what I understand, used a bone substitute. They think he could have lost his teeth from the mercury oxide that might have been used to treat his smallpox and malaria. It's interesting. They said during one of George Washington's battles, it was said he had to ride with a pillow on his saddle while being ill with fever. They think he had dysentery and his tushy was in so much pain from the dysentery and the pooping that he needed a pillow. Now, in 1799, George Washington died of presumed epiglottitis, sore throat, and difficulty breathing. They say his end was painful because doctors tried to burn and blister him to draw out the humors, which was something they did back then in the 17 and 1800s. So um, if I do get more, I, I will. But I have this piece where I talk about the uh, medical issues of presidents. James Garfield. This is interesting. James Garfield was shot twice, once in the arm and once in the back on July 2nd, 1881. The bullets and wounds supposedly weren't lethal. But back then, they didn't have sterile technique. The practitioners used their fingers to find the bullets. So when he was shot at a train station, they worked on him there. They think sticking fingers into his wounds, which would have obviously been very, very painful, caused him to have an infection. Then doctors restricted his eating because they thought the bullet pierced the bell. How did they feed him then? Well, they fed James Garfield allegedly by rectal enema. They gave him beef bullion, egg yolks, milk, whiskey, and opium through his rectum. It was considered a nutritional ex uh, a nutritional enema. Now, uh, that is obviously not very medically sound. You can absorb things through your rectum. You can absorb some fluids. You can't absorb some medications, but you wouldn't really absor absorb nutrition. Interestingly, Alexander Graham Bell devised a metal detector made of a battery and several metal coils positioned on a wooden platform connected to an earpiece to find the bullet. Unfortunately, James Garfield never recovered. He ended up dying 80 days later. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson lived till he was 83 years old. He was not a vegetarian, but he was ahead of his time by eating less meat 
and increasing others to increase their vegetables. He also had good sleep habits. He would sleep five to eight hours a night in a reclined position. He said, whether I retire to bed early or late, I rise with the sun. So he was pretty in tune with circadian rhythm and keeping to that. He was against tobacco. He moderately used alcohol. He said, you are not to conclude I'm a drinker. My measure is a perfectly sober three or four glasses at dinner and not a drop at any other time. But as to those three or four glasses, I am very fond. Now, uh, three to four glasses, uh, that is still a lot. You know, it's, yeah, and I know glasses were smaller back then, but that is interesting that he used um, uh, some restraint. It has been postulated he had Asperger's too. Asperger's. William Taft. William Taft weighed over 300 pounds. I think he was a poster child for sleep apnea. He supposedly would nod off during the day and during meetings with world leaders, similar to Biden, but for other reasons. It was presumed he had narcolepsy, most likely a result of a sleep apnea. But get this, his doctor put him on a low-carb diet. After that, he lost 60 pounds. So he's also a poster child for Atkins. FDR. FDR, we believe, had polio, but now people are postulating it could have been something else. He had a cerebral hemorrhage, very high blood pressure. It's been postulated he also had malignant melanoma above his left eyebrow. And because of this, um, it caused his hemorrhage when it spread to the brain. So there has been a lot of debate on what he had. Um, in fact, some think he, some think he had a spinal cord injury. Um, he might have been paralyzed from a blood clot to the lower spinal cord. He might have had Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is where your immune system attacks your nerves. Um, they think he might have suffered a spinal cord injury. Back in 2021, when he was sailing on his yacht, he fell overboard into the icy waters of the Bay of Fundy. And he was he felt paralyzed, uh, a paralyzation of his body. Then he complained of low back pain, went for a swim to hope it eased the soreness. It got worse. His legs became weaker. By day three, he couldn't hold his own weight. His skin became very sensitive. And he was in a lot of pain. And so it's interesting how when you look at what happened to him when he was younger, and we could go a little bit more into detail, but uh, um, you know he also had a fever. So that could, you say, well, maybe it was polio because he had a fever, but he has had ascending paralysis, facial paralysis, prolonged bowel and bladder dysfunction, numbness and hypersensitivity of the skin. Ascending paralysis you see with Guillain-Barre, where you start to get, you start to have more of a paralysis in the feet. So, it's interesting. You know, uh, so uh, whether it was polio or not, still fascinating what he went through and still went on to be president. Abraham Lincoln, there has been some debate on whether he was suicidal. He had Marfan's syndrome. Now, Marfan's syndrome, people believe, is where you have very, very long arms, you have other issues, but what they think he might have had was a genetic disorder that made him Marfanoid, where he was tall, lanky, long limbs, uh, large lower lip, history of constipation, bumpy lips, pseudo-depression. And in fact, he wrote a suicide soliloquy. We believe he wrote this, and um, um, we think maybe he might have had, you know. Uh, that wasn't his cause of death, though. Abraham Lincoln was shot in the head, but it took him 11 hours to die. The doctors were able to relieve the intracranial pressure. Did an amazing job, but he still fell unconscious. They were never able to revive him. As we've spoken about, Woodrow Wilson had a stroke back in 1919. It was believed that his wife, Edith, ran the country while he was bedridden. He ends up dying three years after leaving office at the age of 67. Dwight D. Eisenhower had suffered a heart attack in 55. He originally thought it was indigestion. Recovery time was much slower. He was kept on bed rest. He was considered resigning, but he regained his strength, and he successfully ran for a second term. John F. Kennedy, as I've said before, he was wearing a back brace, and that might have caused him to die. When the bullet, when he was hit by the first bullet, the back brace kept him upright. He was on it because of Addison's, and he had suffered chronic back problems. If he would have slumped over after being hit the first time in the neck, he wouldn't have then been still upright for the shooter to get him in the head. And so, um, you know, 
Addison's disease, we've spoken about a lot. He also had thyroid issues. But when you look at the other presidents, Ulysses S. Grant had thyroid cancer. Chester Arthur, Bright's disease, which affected his kidneys. Teddy Roosevelt had a detached retina and bullet lodged in his rib, uh, in his ribs. Herbert Hoover had GI cancer, GI bleed. Richard Nixon had blood clots. George H.W. Bush had Graves' disease and hyperthyroidism. A lot more to talk about, but that's a summary of some of the health of some of our previous presidents. One eight seven seven Doc Dolly. Dr. Dahlia here. Addictions can sneak up on us and come in many forms, whether it's drugs, alcohol, sex, video games, porn, or something less obvious, such as food, internet, or shopping. Addiction can seem innocent at first and then evolve into an insurmountable evil. In our book, Addiction Basics, Caitlin Kalikas and I dive into the common addictions and provide tips for identifying and preventing these before they sneak in and take over our lives. Addiction Basics can be found on Amazon or my website, drdahlia.com. Check it out. At Hotshot Secret, we share the science behind common diesel problems and their solutions. For example, Hotshot Secret Stiction Eliminator. Stiction, that sticky friction, undermines the performance of diesel engines. Third-party ASTM testing verifies that Stiction Eliminator removes two times as much stiction than any alternative on the retail shelf. Stiction Eliminator is formulated to be left in the engine oil. It works as you drive. Available at truck stops, tractor supply, O'Reilly's Auto Parts, and online at HotshotSecret.com. Hotshot Secret. Powered by science. All right, we are back on the Dr. Dahlia Show, one eight seven seven doc dolly one 877 docdali So, to use a baby pacifier or not? I've been asked that. I had two boys. One, we did the pacifier. One didn't want the pacifier. Our life was easier with the one with the pacifier because we could shut him up by giving him the pacifier. But I wasn't a fan of it. He would spit it out. It would drop on the ground. He had a favorite binky. We called it a binky. So we'd have to wash it off or dip it in something to sterilize it. And this would go on multiple times a minute. And so I tell parents if they don't have to use the pacifier, you know, try to come up with another way for baby to be pacified, for them to have to chronically suck on something. There's not really a lot of medical advantages. Well, now researchers have found that overexposure to pacifiers affect the language skills of infants by the time they reach the age of two. A study examined 1,187 infants based in Oslo, Norway, to explore the speech and language implications of pacifier use. Infants were divided into two age groups, 12-month-olds and 24-month-olds, so basically one- and two-year-olds. Each child's parents were asked to provide detailed hourly reports specifying how regularly they were administering the common comfort to their offspring. This was achieved across two-month intervals. The team was able to calculate the total number of hours spent with the binky and across their childhood as far as lifespan pacifier use. Each parent completed a detailed questionnaire featuring communicative development inventories, lists of words common in the vocabularies of each age group, and whether each child was familiar with them or not. The scope for 24 months old was about 731 words. And then they adjusted and they showed that kids who were using the binkies or the pacifiers more had less vocabulary at their disposal. Children with a higher than average use as they approach the age of two had lower scores in their vocabulary comprehension and production, not to mention the capacity to speak and be spoken to. So the more a pacifier was used, the lower the child's vocabulary score. Now, I only have my study is basically my two boys. My binky boy, my pacifier boy, binky boy, uh, he spoke well and early. The second one who didn't use a pacifier had less of a vocabulary. So that's not a scientific study. 
So I, I think there's limitations, and I don't want there to be generalities of if the kid uses a binky, there's a problem. But pacifier use peaks in the U.S., and let me give credit where credit is due. This is according to Newsweek. But pacifier use in the U.S. peaks around three months. Health benefits would be to ease discomfort. They believe pacifier use might play a role in preventing sudden infant death syndrome. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, however, says stop pacifier use by the age of three. Now, my kid, I think he was nine months old when he stopped, uh, maybe six months old. Pacifiers, once they learn real food, I think they start to rethink, you know, and um, the, the, you know, some babies might turn from pacifiering to sucking their thumb. I was never a big thumb sucker. I don't even think I liked pacifiers as a kid. I liked candy, but I didn't like food. I wasn't a big food eater. I wasn't really big on putting things in my mouth. I mean, I brushed my teeth when I had to because my mom would yell at me, but I didn't like food. I didn't like pacifiers. Didn't want to suck my thumb. But why do kids do that? Well, uh, we're still studying that. We're still trying to figure out which kids need that comfort and which don't. Some parents would get very embarrassed saying, I don't beat the kid. I don't know why they're... It doesn't mean the kids are getting beaten. No, it's just for them. Um, there's some positives to it. It means they've learned how to self-soothe. How, as opposed to other kids that are... I need mommy or daddy to feel better. And so I never had a problem if a child wanted to suck their thumb and they were young enough or use a binky because they were figuring out how to cope, which I think is extremely, extremely important to know how to you know, know how to cope with things. So like I said, I'm mixed. Now, my other son, when he'd be crying, I, you couldn't give him anything. He wanted to be held by mommy. I'm like, okay. And I mean, it was almost where he just lifted up his arms and demanded that I hold him right then and there. Okay, fine. <laughs> really? You can't figure out your own stuff right now? Can't be a little bit more independent? The other one, give him a binky, he's good. So it is interesting. And, and, and you know, have I seen changes in them as adults? No, they're both independent. Neither one of them want me to lift them up. You know, they're they're typical... Now, young adults. But uh, I would say rule of thumb is when you do have a child that wants to they'll be consoled, it's totally fine. See what works for them, but also see what works for you. Breastfeeding when they're four years old, not very practical. I get a lot of moms used to do that in caveman days, but the child has to be in daycare. You have to be at work. Not that easy to do. Breastfeeding when they're four months, six months, a year, I support it. I think it's fantastic. But, you know, children need to eventually learn other ways to comfort themselves. And I think it does help them psychologically. In terms of a binky and vocabulary, uh, I'm still working on what that connection would be into why a child would talk less if they were using a binky as a baby. Uh, I remember seeing my friend's child pull out the binky and say, yep, I want mac and cheese. And then they would put the binky back in their mouth. I think I think once a child is talking, I think they're done with the pacifier. That's just me. I mean, to pull out the binky to convey your dinner order at McDonald's, I think the child is done with the binky. But we do, you know, uh, I think I have a problem with teaching parents how to have children cope. When my children would throw a temper tantrum and everybody would look at you with a crossed face in the restaurant or at the store, like you need to control your child. At first, I would look at them as you never had a child, you know, scream child. But most parents totally understand it and laugh. But what I would do is I would take my child to the car because I didn't want to ruin anybody else's meal or anybody else's shopping experience. And I would let my kids scream in the car. If it was hot outside, I would put the air conditioning on. 
If it was cold, I put the heat. It was ambient temperature, and I let them scream. I wouldn't sit in the car with them. I'd close the door, and I'd stand outside the car. Then I'd hear them stop. I'm like, are you done? Are you ready to go back in? Okay, fine. Just finish. And you know what? They stopped. After a couple minutes, they stopped. Like, feel better now? And why are they doing that? Well, it's because they're smart. They might not want to sit with grandma and grandpa, right? I didn't want to sit with the in-laws either. Yeah, that's how they convey their discontent. They may not want the food you are serving at, you know, from the kitchen at dinner time. They may not want to go to bed. They are trying to communicate with you. So teach them how to communicate with you. But you also have to teach them boundaries. And if they decide to throw temper tantrums, let them finish your temper tantrum. And then when they're done, when you're ready, now we could go back out into public. But I think parents are just so afraid that they're like, let's just give them candy. Let's just give them something. Give them, give them the iPhone. Well, no. That isn't always proper parenting. Because these kids are going to have to figure out how to self-soothe, how to cope, how to deal with an hour with grandma and grandpa. Because later they're going to have to deal with the whole Thanksgiving weekend with the in-laws. Okay? Well, we need to learn how to cope. one eight seven seven doc dolly one eight seven seven D O C D A L I. Considered by most, optimized curcumin is one of the few bioavailable and highly absorbable curcumin products on the market. Hi, I'm Dr. Mitch. Since most chronic diseases have inflammation, our optimized curcumin seems to be a perfect addition to any nutritional program. It makes sense to me that preventing or reducing inflammation is a key component to our overall health. The Mayo Clinic found that curcumin can decrease swelling and inflammation, has antioxidant properties, and research suggests that curcumin can prevent cancer, or at least slow the spread of cancer, and in many instances make chemotherapy more effective. It protects our healthy cells even from radiation. TotalWellness.com, where we help you to look good, feel good, and enjoy Total Wellness. Self-reliance. It's not a phrase we hear much in our culture these days. It might conjure up images of pioneers, the West, rifles, strapping men and strong women. But what does it mean for us in today's world? The New American Magazine has just released its latest collector's edition, Self-Reliance, Foundation of Freedom. In it, the New American authors outline the necessity of self-reliance for a free people, tips for self-reliant living, and the importance of not giving up hope. This unique edition includes articles on the self-sufficiency of the founders, preparing for a worst-case scenario, firearms, financial self-reliance, the importance of community, and many other topics by expert writers. Now, for a limited time, The New American is offering a bundle of three collector's editions, Self-Reliance, The Great Reset, and Trump World, for just $19.95. Available at shopjbs.org. Visit shopjbs.org today. All right, we are back on Dr. Dahlia's show. Thank you all for tuning in. 1877 Doc Dolly, 1877 D O C D A L I. So, Many of you are in between jobs and you're interviewing and some of you are taking what you could get. I get that. Some of you are trying to find your dream job. And we're seeing, especially with the shift with the millennials and the Gen Z's, which we're seeing some articles talk about how they don't seem to have the concept of dream job as we older generations might have. And um, I don't blame them. It's not a very easy job market right now. Plus, jobs keep changing. So whereas when I grew up in the 80s, a dream job would be you know, office in a beautiful Wall Street 
well, well, skyscraper, getting benefits, maybe a pension, meetings, expense account, paid travel, and getting to work your way up from the mailroom to VP to CEO. That would be a dream job. And no, didn't happen for a lot of us. So when younger individuals are told, well, you need to find your dream job, or you make a lot of money, you get to advance, you're going to get to retire, there's going to be money for retirement. You get to, they're like, what are you talking about? The average person is in a job for two, three years. It doesn't happen that way. And so there's a huge disconnect. There's not a lot of loyalty. There's not a lot of loyalty from the employee. There's not a lot of loyalty from the employer. Once employees saw what employers did to their parents, they're not going to give an employer 20 years of their life just for them to get dumped when they're 40 or 50. So we have a huge disconnect. And there's not a lot of jobs out there that offer that longevity. Well, I read this one article and I used to interview people for jobs and I pavement pounded. I would try and find jobs. And um, they give some interesting advice. This is Emily Levine, executive vice president at Career Group Companies from Los Angeles, California, has worked in recruiting since 2010. And she told Business Insider some of the worst things you could do while meeting with prospective new employers. She says the way you handle yourself and the information you divulge during a job interview is vital. Now, a lot of this is common sense, but I think it is good that it's being discussed to remind us. She said, first, she warned against sharing too much about what you expect from the position at first. So if you say, well, I want to see um, when I get their changes. So when you hire me, I want to see the curriculum completely transform. I want to see us bring out new products. I want to change the way this product is. I want to change the hours. Um, that, uh, they might be like, no, nope. we just want you to do the job that we want you to do. Okay. We're not ready for all that. And it might show that you might be a pain in the butt. Now, I am of the thinking that you do not want to go into a job that's going to snow you and not necessarily be upfront. And you want to make sure that you're going to a job where you feel your needs are met for growth, et cetera. But sometimes that could turn them off. Sometimes you just need to get into the door. Another issue um, that they've said, well, like, like, like another example of that is expecting too much from the position. I want amazing work-life balance. I don't know if I would bring that up. Hey, every job now promises I look on their on their job uh, description, work-life balance. They're all going to say, yeah, 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 you're going to get work-life balance. And then they know that people, once they get there, are like, well, no, I got an email on a Saturday or I did have to work a lot later because I didn't finish this project or something came up and I had to work when I didn't have to. And so work-life balance is very subjective. And so they might think, well, you're not going to like this here because if work-life balance is your top priority and something pops up, are you going to be you know, disenfranchised and want to quit? Another thing that they suggest is don't be over eager to get promoted instead of focusing on the job you applied for. So I knew better when I would work fast food or restaurant. I never said I want to be manager. I was so enthusiastic about the job at hand. And actually, I really was. So I am applying for this position. If they think you are just trying to get in the door or a means to an end, and then you're going to leave if you're not happy, then they're not going to want you. I mean, if they want front desk, they need front desk. If you're like, well, I'm going to take this front desk position because I want to be vice president of the hotel. They're going to probably consider somebody who really wants to be front desk, meaning I love interaction with people. I want to be with customers and clients. I want to have that, you know, uh, a diverse day 
And, you know, it, it's exciting. It makes the day go by and it's fun. You get to meet a lot of people and I get to learn a lot about how the hotel works in the front desk. That answer is going to work a lot better. But the person that's interviewing you might want to be promoted. And here now they see that you're going to be their competition. They might not like it. Show that you are excited about the job you're applying for. I always urge that my students, when they interview for residency or if you're interviewing for a job, do your research. If you don't research about the company and you say, oh, wow, well, this DDUS place is great because I love your shoes. And they're like, we're DDUS. We're not a DDUS. Do you even know what we do? That could look bad. Do your research. Don't just wing it. Just go, oh, you know what? I'm lazy. I'm fine. Because then it shows you're lazy. Well, I don't want to travel. This is a job that has multiple headquarters. And we we do travel. Did you, did you, re just do your research. Because that's, yeah. And then in terms of you being interviewed, many of us are not interviewed in person anymore, which I think is, really a detriment to people learning who we are. We don't really get to have that, that one-on-one -on -one sort of, it, it's, I, I'm just, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm really kind of disappointed in that. I really like the personal touch, but now it's virtual. And if you're uncomfortable or you seem to be distracted during a virtual interview, they don't know if you suffer from attention deficit they don't know if there's other people listening in. Is it that you're not happy? Is it so look comfortable? Try to, it's hard going through a virtual interview. It's, it's not easy, but have the eye contact, know where your camera is, practice ahead of time. And if somebody gives you a question that you can't answer, say that's a good question. If you don't think you could answer it, don't panic. Say, I don't want to give you the wrong answer. You're asking about what I'd like in terms of salary, or you're asking about what my availability is with travel. I want to discuss this with my partner, and I want to give you the answer that's correct. I don't want to say the wrong thing now. Can I email you after this interview, after I consult with my family? In terms of working weekends instead of weekdays, I love doing that. I think I'm fine with that. I just need to consult with my family and let them know and make arrangements for babysitting. And so I think that's okay. If they want somebody to go, yeah, 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 that's fine. I, th you know, th then that's them. But showing that you're going to make plans so it isn't an issue later, I, I think I think is, is good. And don't just panic and knee-jerk answers. Be very careful also, I'm adding, that this, this is my own advice. Uh, don't badmouth your other boss and badmouth your other work. Why are you leaving the other place of work? Uh, they're all toxic. That doesn't, that might not answer. Is it, what? what, what is really, you know, there, there's toxicity everywhere. So why? Well, I didn't think there was going to be room for promotion. I didn't see people advance. one eight seven seven doc dolly don't go away. Did you know that healthy arteries make a gas? <laughs> yes, actually three known gases. Hi, I'm Dr. Mitch, and nitric oxide is a gas that's readily made all day long to keep our arteries open by relaxing the blood vessel walls. By doing this, our circulation is increased, bringing blood, oxygen, and nutrients to every part of your body. Both age and poor diet can lead to a loss of this precious gas and in turn, blood pressure can go up, energy can go down, and you can get tingling in your hands and feet. Well, our product, Ultimate Nitric Oxide, can easily help fix this lack of nitric oxide. Go to TotalWellness.com. That's TotalWellness.com, where we are helping you to look good, feel good, and enjoy Total Wellness.